got into virtual reality and immersive technologies because when you look at the platforms, not just the products, but the platforms that are really going to revolutionize how we think, interact, and really going back to the human element, there's been no platform that's been more powerful than virtual reality. We believe in this so much, in fact, we've actually invested in core different areas. So what you know about HTC Vive is Vive is a technology wing, right? So those are going to be all your tangible ways to experience immersive technologies. Vive Port is actually the marketplace for that because we understand that Steam, other places are the best places to get game and entertainment content. But what, how would you deploy your immersive solutions within the CU2 system? How do you get it to different 23 other campuses? And when you're ready to turn that on for the public, where do you go? Right? So Vive Port really aims to be your non-gaming destination for all forms of immersive content. And Vive Studios, that's our first party content generator. As the industry and all the different ecosystem players start to create really immersive and great pieces of content, we understand there may be some gaps of how to do that. And we aim to fill those gaps with really high quality immersive experiences. And lastly, VIVEX. VIVEX is our 100 million global incubator. We have offices in San Francisco, Shenzhen, Taipei, and Beijing. And what we really aim to do there is find those innovators in the marketplace help them to connect to other innovators, those that really kind of believe in the power of immersive technologies, and accelerate their growth. So what is virtual reality? Hopefully today, um, ho hopefully today we'll go a, a little bit beyond what that actually looks like. And the, the actual definition of VR is the creation of virtual environment presented our senses in such a way that we experience it, it, it as if we were really there. I don't really care for the definition because you can't really do anything with that definition. Hopefully by the end of just this conversation and in the course of today, you have your own definition of what is immersive technologies, what is VR, and what does it really mean to me. Let's, we have to start with the basics though. VR has been around for decades. In fact, the early, some of the earlier uses of VR have actually been predated uh, the internet. What we know as VR today actually started around the same time. And while VR was extremely expensive, $500,000 million plus for a single VR implementation for caves, they were, they were effective, they were impactful. And because of the high price point and the proprietary nature of these different technologies, only NASA and the, and the government was really able to utilize that. But even then, even 50 years ago, we knew that immersive technologies was able to recreate and do things that traditional methods of teaching and education could not accomplish. When we look at kind of the, just the overall journey of the headsets, the headsets is kind of your, your, your entry product of what we think of immersive learning and technologies. Um, everything from a stereoscope to 1838 to the Viewmaster in 1939, and now to the current HMD market, we've always wanted that first person point of view and immersion to something. And now as we evolve, there's, there's a lot of conversation about when do I use a Google Cardboard? What about mobile? What about console? What about PC? Do I use any of these things? Yes, you do. The, because virtual reality and augmented reality, they're all tools. Knowing when to use the tool for the problem you're trying to solve is actually really critical. When we look at, when we go from like left to right to cardboard to PC, what we really look at is levels of immersion. Where cardboard may not be as immersive, it has a really high addressable market. It has really low barriers to entry. But when you really need to drive that impact, where do you go? you definitely go to PC-based VR. PC-based VR will continue to always be the Ferrari of VR experiences because it does require a lot of throughput, a lot of processing to really drive that true sensory immersion. Does that mean anything in between is not good? No, because if you have a solution and you're trying to get that tool into the right hands, your addressability is important. Sometimes Google Cardboard or mobile, they're great gateways into immersive technologies and they're much easier to deploy, but as your solutions and the impact need to go up, as your levels of immersion need to go up, then you start to use more deeper platforms. And these are important areas to really note, um, and th we'll kind of talk about these throughout, throughout the course of the, of, the, of the conversation, so we can kind of really try to define when do we need to use each. I look at immersive technology as really two categories. When anybody really asks me, what is VR, what is AR, I really use these two definitions because I feel like they apply to many things. I use immersion, and that's a phrase used quite a bit, and sometimes you may have different definitions, but I use it as a, uh, for a deeper level of mental engagement. 
In fact, if you look at many things, even this conversation, the deeper you're mentally engaged, the deeper you learn, you learn it faster, you learn it longer, and you're able to impact that change for a lot longer. And, and that's a fundamental value proposition, whether it's entertainment, whether it's training, whether it's education, whether it's medical. We all strive for a deep level of mental engagement. That's why we have lectures, that's why we have labs, right? To kind of go through that full cycle of how we actually learn. Accessibility, the ability to access environments that would be otherwise impossible or impractical. This also is really the hallmark of what immersive technology allows you to do, especially virtual reality. Imagine being able to train somebody how to put out a fire in really high heat situations. Yes, it's a thing that needs to happen, but it's a very difficult and very dangerous thing to do. Imagine being able to have the top level education from top level professors. Well, the accessibility to that in our current platform situation is very difficult. So AR and VR really aim to kind of solve for that. We are bringing you an eyewitness account of what's happening on the Wilmoth Farm, Grover's Mill, New Jersey. We now return you to Carl Phillips at Grover's Mill. Ladies and gentlemen, my on? Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, here I am, back of a stone wall that adjoins Mr. Wilma's garden. From here, I get a sweep of the whole scene. I'll give you every detail as long as I can talk and as long as I can see. The more state police have arrived. They're drawing up a cordon in front of the pit. About 30 of them. No need to push the crowd back now. They're willing to keep their distance. The captain's conferring with someone. Can't quite see who. Oh, yes, I believe it's Professor Pearson. Yes, it is. Now, now they've parted, and the professor moves around one side, studying the object while the captain and two policemen advance with something in their hands. I can see it now. It's a white handkerchief tied to a pole. Flag of truce. If those creatures know what that means, what anything means. Wait a minute. Something's happening. A humped shape is rising out of the pit. I can make out a small beam of light against a mirror. What's that? There's a jet of flame springing from the mirror and it leaps right at the advancing men. It strikes them head on. Oh, Lord, they're turning into flames. Now oh, the whole field's caught up by the woods, the bars, the, the gas tanks, tanks of the automobiles spreading everywhere. It's coming this way now, about 20 yards to my right. Ladies and gentlemen, due to circumstances beyond our control, we are unable to continue the broadcast from Grover's Mill. Evidently, there's some difficulty with our field transmission. However, we will return to that point at the earliest opportunity. In the meantime, we have a late bulletin from San Diego, California. Professor Indelkoffer, speaking at a dinner of the California Astronomical Society, expressed the opinion that the explosions on Mars are undoubtedly nothing more than severe volcanic disturbances on the surface of the planet. We continue now with our piano interlude. I use uh, or, or, uh, H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds as an example of the power of immersion. Uh, when that came out, I believe it was 1930, uh, some of the reports were a little exaggerated about how the, the pandemonium that actually happened from that uh, radio reading of War of the Worlds. A lot of people thought, actually, were really being invaded by aliens. I think what's more impactful is even though once the, the reading was kind of broke it down to actually, it was not a hoax, it was actually more of a reading. People still saw, saw aliens for, uh, for, for, for many, many years and, and even decades. In fact, the definition of what people thought extraterrestrial beings are came from your auditory first experience of, uh, of aliens from War of the Worlds. And really that's a great example of immersive platforms and experiences. In fact, immersion doesn't always have to be very complex um, headsets or investments in platforms. Well, we do know that when you have the ability to do things in the virtual environment as you do in real life, meaning if I can move around, if I can kind of pick things up as I would do in the real space, what the level of fidelity and the, all the other things you need to develop immersive experiences actually goes down. When I am stationary and I want to be immersed, I need a higher degree of fidelity, I need more screens, uh, I need brighter screens, I need things to look really real. But the moment I can move and step around and do things, all of a sudden, the level of fidelity goes down. What does that mean to us? It means that you can capture content that is far easier to create and accessible. 
the moment I can move around in an environment, 360 videos all of a sudden become a more compelling thing versus a passive thing in a, in a mobile headset that may not be that compelling. When we look at virtual reality, augmented reality, and even merged reality, um, a lot of these concepts can get kind of confusing. Everyone wants to know, hey, are these guys competing? You know, so-and-so is doing this stuff in AR. What do you feel about that? First of all, AR, VR, and even MR, we're all complementing technologies, all aim to drive immersion and accessibilities. Virtual reality drives immersion by recreating an environment, right, that may be either uh, imagined or real, uh, but essentially it's digital. Augmented reality drives immersion by keeping you in the moment and overlaying information that is important to you. In merged reality, this one is actually a very confusing term for a lot. It is really just the intersection of, of both. Uh, when do you really pick one versus the other? M many things will have the capabilities of having merged reality, so it's not really something you should really concern yourself from a, do I go VR or do I go MR? We'll first talk about what is the problem you're trying to solve for, and when you have innovation labs, you'll have the ability to kind of choose from all of those. This particular image of virtual reality is actually one of my favorites. A lot of it's because, so that girl there touching that digital dog is actually used uh, by photogrammetry. So the environment she's actually stepping in is the actual place that that image was taken. So th that blades of grass, the surface of just the curves of the hills, the rocks, all those things really exist. Actually, it's from that place. And photogrammetry, what it does, it actually takes a series of, of pictures, of stills, and st stitches them together so you're able to move, up, move about this space. So if you were to even take this room that's photogrammetry, I can kind of recreate a full 360 experience of this room by stitching the different pieces together. Now, overlaying the digital animal there, that guide of where to go in that environment, really kind of shows how you can kind of quickly take existing assets and overlaying them with digital assets and really rapidly creating meaningful content. But augmented reality seems to kind of have a, a lot of confusion on what it really is. Uh, I, I think Pokemon Grow is great because it introduced us to the power of augmented reality from our existing platforms and mobile devices. And where Pokemon Go might have been fun, uh, oftentimes when we see this, this version of augmented reality as a use case, people are like, okay, that's cool. I don't really see it driving change. In fact, augmented reality is not just headsets, but it's definitely mobile platforms like tablets and, and, laptop, uh, and, and mobile phones. And I feel like the, really the near-term opportunities in augmented reality really is in those mobile features, right? And in fact, the, the Apple AR kit folks are here as well, and I would highly recommend even talking to them about kind of th those capabilities because it is really that ecosystem of, of things you can do. Some of the hardest questions we have, right, when you really think about where do you want to go for lunch? How hard is it to answer this question? And it's so basic. Don't we, we ask, we do this every day. We're going to do it whether or not somebody wants us or even asks us to do it, but I feel like it's one of the hardest things to answer. It's, a lot of it's because of how we're, we process that information. And this is really where augmented reality can really help you with processing really daily tasks. So this particular picture of this burger actually is a digital image. And it's, it's an actually augmented reality application that really aims to take a picture of where you're going to eat your food and really you, just, you, just, you don't scroll through categories of foods or, or cuisines, if you will, or just things you'd want to eat. And in fact, if you really think about what you're really hungry for, if nobody asks you what do you want to eat, you actually think about what, what do I, I want a burrito, I want a burger. You don't go, do I want American, do I want Mexican? And in general, when you're talking about groups of people collaborating, it's because the context in which we're able to process information, it's done by current platforms and technologies of categories of lists. Augmented reality really starts to redefine how we are interacting with our world and really asking those questions. And then mixed reality or merged reality really, again, is that intersection. And, and so many of what we see is this is more of just the intersection of AR and VR. Right? So it's, it's more than just having to pick a particular headset that, is, that achieves this. Uh, a lot of VR headsets will do this as well. A lot of augmented reality uh, platforms will do this, do this as well. From a growth of a platform, this is still, that's up and coming. In terms of what's ready to be off the shelf is, is really what you're going to see for VR and mobile AR platforms. And when you start to really look at all the different things that AR and VR do, it is very overlapping, right? It is all going to be about what type of immersion do you want to drive, what type of accessibility is needed. But why now? 
why do, do all these things really matter to me now? Why is it all of a sudden everyone's talking about VR when it's been around for decades? And a lot of it has to do with the consumerization of VR. And to show that, I have a quick little clip um, from um, Mixed Reality. The really, really cool thing about that video is that is what it feels like to be in a VR headset, right? And what you really see about that video, and although that might seem like that took a very expensive studio to create that video, I used the phrase mixed reality earlier. That's because at, at Vive, we use mixed reality phrase for our green screen activations. And really what that is is you have somebody in a headset in front of a green screen, and then we overlay what you're seeing onto that green screen so you see yourself superimposed on a screen. Therefore, all of us in an audience can then start to do that one-to-many. And the one-to-many is critical because it may be very difficult for all 150 of us to be in a headset, but if I can go and put on a headset and actually walk through a particular scenario, maybe manipulate uh, a constellation in a headset, you get my first-person perspective in this kind of green screen environment. And another thing from that video you see as well is when a person's in a headset interacting and you can see what they're looking at, it is truly a, also an immersive uh, engagement for those of us that are around. Right? You, you can take that first person experience, that guide experience, if you will, and many of us can actually interact in that space. And, and it's a great way for multiple groups of, of, of people to really take that uh, experience uh, from a single headset um, environment. Consumerization also means the ability for grandparents, anybody for any level of skill set or level of tech enthusiasm to try VR and get it. And what that really does, it also opens up the opportunities that VR really has. It's no longer specialized skill sets, specialized facilities. So the ability to implement augmented reality and virtual reality has a level of scale that wasn't previously accessible. But I think really the most important thing is when you look at what is virtual reality now, why is it a platform? Virtual reality and augmented reality both are much more than headsets. They are platforms. So when people say, do you think virtual reality is going to stick around? I mean, it's been around. The biggest difference now is you have an ecosystem of players investing a tremendous amount of money and have invested a tremendous amount of money to really revolutionize chipset technology. The GPUs and CPUs we have now have really re have gone through a renaissance of innovation. You're talking about very, very powerful laptops that are actually this thin that three, oh, two years ago were impossible. They did not happen. In fact, that, those laptops are as powerful as three gaming machines of, of uh, later years. And we're seeing continued investment. In fact, the investment in the AR and VR space has even helped spur some of the data and processing you need for cryptocurrency. Right. So, so many of that, those high-end GPUs now is also fueling other industries. And hardware aside, the, if you look at uh, Unreal um, as well as uh, Unity, those engines, it is becoming much easier to create content for virtual and augmented reality. It's no longer proprietary. Right? So you have now open platforms. In fact, if you wanted to create content in VR, you can actually download enough of the Unity uh, libraries and asset store to actually create stuff in headset without any coding experience. In fact, Tom Furness, uh, the godfather of VR, um, fortunately, uh, lucky for us, I'm in Seattle, he's in Seattle, and we had a chance to actually check out. He's bringing in uh, VR into middle schools, a particular middle school and doing a project. He has 12-year-olds teach each other physics and different properties in physics in VR, but they're the ones creating their VR experiences. And they're able to do this is because uh, engines like Unity and Unreal have physics models. So you can put an object in a space and then put in gravity, right? And simulate what happens, put in elasticity and, and surface tension and all these things that are fun to kids and conceptually they're able to do it and experience it firsthand. 
And so learning in AR and VR, what does that, what does that really mean? What we've seen is we're in a place right now where technology has really created sensory overload. Eric Schmidt, uh, former CEO of Apple, said, uh, actually it was in 2010, that there's more content being created from the beginning to 20, 2003 um, in two days uh, than, than the previous humanity, time of man, right? How do you process that level of information? That was in 2010. And only, we've only gotten more information. It's getting very difficult to figure out all the different platforms, tools, technologies, and being relevant. And so what augmented reality and virtual reality really aim to do is really reduce that cognitive load. Virtual reality does that from a training learning standpoint, where augmented reality does that from in the moment situation, right? What is the right piece of information do I need in that time, in that moment? And virtual reality really helps you to process that stream of, of consciousness. Depending on which model you use, a lot of what we talk about, some people say, I'm a kinesthetic learner, I learn by doing, I learn by seeing, I learn by hearing. But the reality is we learn by doing all three of these things. When asked, and these, these numbers can fluctuate, but when asked within these kind of three paradigms, like how do you really learn, it's almost, it's very equal, right, um, in, in terms of that ability to learn. But what we're seeing is because we segment these different categories, we are not engaging our full mental capacity. But it's efficient, right? If you think about our education system in general, K through 12, you, you go through the various subject matters. I go to my English class, I go to health, um, I go to social studies. The reason why you do that is because it's efficient. I can get the most amount of throughput by going through these different categories. But if we follow the same efficiency model to how we eat, if in the morning I ate um, high starch foods, then for lunch I had meat, and then in the middle of the day I might have had some fruit, and then for dinner I had just vegetables, if I did it that way, would I be healthier? Of course I'd be healthier, it'd be more impactful, but would I ever want to eat again? But it's funny, right? But that's how we learn. That's how the K through 12 system is structured because you get the level of throughput, but why? As educators, as policymakers, you guys have known for decades what's the right way to do things, but the technology and the platforms just didn't exist to do that. We've gone through online to mobile to all these various different tools of helping us to multitask, right? Hopefully something sticks. But really when you look at the power of VR and AR, the, what it means to have embodied learning really changes all that. When using VR and AR, at the end of the day, we form deeper memory bonds, deeper memory bonds and we achieve greater knowledge acquisition. Essentially, we're able to use both parts of our brain when we need to use them. And when you are deficient or just even have the, the lack of interest in using one part or the other, VR and AR help to compensate for those categories because they're more aligned to the natural way of learning. There was a study done by, I believe it was the Journal of Education, Technologies, and Society that did some uh, lab tests on students using AR. Ultimately, students that used AR had deeper level engagement of the material, they learned it for longer, and more importantly, they were more engaged, they were excited about the subject matters. And so that's essentially the, the same value props if you look at for, for VR. We know that VR facilitates model building. We know it allows us to assimilate information from various disciplines and topics. It also helps to awaken spatial memory. And spatial memory is super critical for recalling facts and other abstract concepts much later down the road. It eliminates distractions, really to help us focus and reduce that cognitive load that we have. And equally as important, retention. I don't have this up anywhere on the slides, but we've done some studies in, uh, where HTC as well, uh, we work a lot with the research community, where students that were taught using immersive technologies, in this particular case, VR, C and D, historically C and D students, were taught the same subject matter as A and B students, but the C and D students were taught using VR. At the time the C and D students were tested using the exact same, the only variable was the method in which they learned, uh, the C and D students performed consistently as well as the A and B students. Six months later, the C and D students performed slightly better. A year later, they performed even better. In fact, the more time that progressed, historic C and D students outperformed the A and B students and the C and D students used immersive technologies. 
Although in the education space, you're like, that, that's amazing, right? But we've known this. NASA has known this. The Department of Defense has known this uh, for years. And that's why the time now is super exciting, because now these platforms are accessible. So what, do you, what does that mean to, uh, to us? To, what does that mean to educators? Your time is even more critical. Because if you look at uh, Bloom's taxonomy, and actually there's actually a, the, the newer model of Bloom's taxonomy actually takes away evaluation. But in the order and kind of what this is listed, you have your kind of your lower order thinking skills of memorization, understanding abstract concepts, just kind of that root functions that you want to do from maybe your first couple years of college or your intro level courses. Those things are relatively mundane, but they set the foundation for everything else you need to do. But if you think about memorization, retention, understanding abstract concepts, AR and VR are the perfect platforms to increase the retention of those areas, right? And then when you get into critical thinking areas, areas where it requires debate, requires analysis, and most importantly, requires new thought and point of view, that is where educators are critical and continue to play a major role. Now imagine being able to spend more time on impacting those areas because augmented and virtual platforms allow you to have the throughput and then engagement uh, for those kind of more rudimentary skill sets. And I think that's why this conference today is so exciting. Because VR and AR, they're taking off because there's a community of developers, of platform creators, of hardware partners. What we have today is also a platform, a platform of 23 different universities coming together for a common goal of how are we going to work together to really impact education in ways that we know that can, and making sure that our students continue to be some of the best trained and educated in the workflow, in the workforce. But at the end of the day, VR is fun. Uh, and that, that's, the, that's my favorite thing about this platform, because So the really cool thing about that video, and before we really get into empathy, sympathy, is if you really think about kind of Jam Studio VR, Jam Studio VR was actually created uh, by a company, uh, Beams. So Beams is really out there to help um, students and, and those actually even in hospitals to kind of have more physical interaction activity. In the, in the Jam Studios VR example, uh, th those actually in there many times were not professional musicians. They were able to pick up a guitar, pick up a drum set, and actually play music that's actually fun for the first time. What Jam Studios VR really does, it's a good example of an intersection of multiple technologies, not just VR. So when you pick up a guitar and you play it for the first time, it doesn't sound like you're playing it for the first time. So you have the ability at that point to say, OK, if I really wanted to play VR, here's what it could be. You're embodying the future of the capabilities of of, of playing a guitar. In fact, you're able to try many things in their elements because they actually have a software layer that actually does auto-tuning, that makes sure you're, you're hitting the right tones, it kind of balances it out. So you can still harness your creative abilities, but really understand something that's moderately abstract and very future thinking. So if I want to go invest my time in music, I can really figure out which areas to go into. Those gaming examples have great translations into non-gaming examples because imagine your first day of college or career day. Imagine being able to actually walk in the path of the job that I think I want to go study for, right? That first-hand experience is going to not just help you say, this is what I really want to do and spend my time. It may also help you to say, this is not what I really want to do, right? 
Um, there are actually certain schools that also that help intercity schools where you have a lot of substitute teachers and kind of turnover. They're also now using a very similar experience of first person and what it feels like to be in that classroom. So you're ready to engage by that first person experience. And it's hard to talk about education if you don't really talk about empathy and sympathy. And I'll touch very briefly on this because you can easily talk about an hour. But what is, why is it when you talk about education training that empathy and sympathy come up a lot, especially in virtual reality? The big reason is empathy, when we talk about empathy, it's really understanding something from education, right? Someone tells you, uh, sorry, sympathy is really understanding that a situation from education, saying, hey, this is bad, this person went through, like, think about the, the hurricanes in Puerto Rico. Uh, hurricanes in Puerto Rico, we know there's a lot of devastation, we saw it, so we sympathize with that, but how many of us actually took action? Um, in, in fact, we did an impromptu kind of little survey of those that actually donated, and you find that a lot of those either have, have lived on islands, have families, but really have that empathy. And that goes beyond, let's say, giving or that first person, but when you can truly understand first person, that really starts to drive change in, in organizations and in individuals. And when you talk about the first person experience, that's kind of why VR is such a powerful empathy machine. In fact, Donnie De La Pena's group, the emblematic group, actually took upon, and regardless of what you feel about the issue, and I, and I think this is an important thing, many topics and issues, you're not going to change people's minds. In fact, you should not. But having a level of understanding of what you're trying to accomplish is super important. And, and across the line, the team actually did something we talked about, having the right levels of immersion. So they took an audio track of somebody trying to get to their Planned Parenthood appointment. And they overlay that with a moderately simple digital representation. And as you're in that headset, you actually, you, you see yourself in the car going up. You hear the protest, you hear the name calling, and you hear the person talking to the driver how nervous and afraid, viscerally afraid they are because it's actually a real experience. It's, these are not actors. And as, then you now have to get out of the car. As being that in first person, you actually feel really, really nervous. You're like, do I, does, can I just take this off now, right? But you have to go do it, because ultimately you have to walk across the line. It's a very short distance to the door, and you see people stop you, and you hear real audio of the slurs, the things, the mean things people are saying. And then you have to eventually get into the door. That was probably the hardest and longest like 10 steps I've taken. And I'm in headset all the time, and I still get goosebumps thinking about that moment. Um, in fact, even talking about it, I think it's probably one of the first times I've even talked about it without being able to choke up because the level of empathy. And again, regardless of what you feel about the issue and what we've seen happen, we've seen policymakers actually that have gone through this that said, yes, I'm not going to change my point of view. However, I don't think the young women in our community should be treated like this. And that's really the power of empathy and the power of VR. You could Even this story, hearing it, from me may, may seem like hey, that, that's crazy, that's really, you know, that, that's something that should happen, but experiencing it firsthand, having been this many months later, still stays with you. Now think about that, what happens with that for knowledge, right, for, for brand engagement. And ultimately, embodied empathy really means the ability to, once you have seen things first person, you, you have the ability to actually truly have the first person empathy uh, for that area. But what does that really mean? What does all this really mean for education and training? Sometimes education and training either separate or really kind of pull into one group. Um, I look at education and training not as separate things, but really an extension, right? Education really means, um, to me personally, the ability to have a curriculum, not just have kind of one point of view. The training aspect is that pull through of the ability to take what you learned and actually create uh, actual actionable movements, results, workflow changes of that. And where do we see that? In firefighter training, there's actually a group in Melbourne that uh, was a remote firefighter uh, group. They're volunteer firefighters, and at the end of the day, these guys are the first responders that protect a community. But because they're remote, they don't have the facilities, what they really needed to do is find better ways to train. They were very far, a many hour drive from the next city that actually had the ability to train. So they actually, they actually uh, partnered with Deakin University. One of the things you'll notice is a lot of these examples that I use, they're all from universities. Right. Most of what we know about VR and AR, it, it's actually from universities. It's from the research places. And a big reason why that is, is because you are not tied down to quarter over quarter growth. You are not tied down to making sure you have some immediate ROI. Your only limitation is your imagination. 
right? And at the end of the day, you guys are truth seekers, right? And as a result of that, when someone says, I have this problem, you guys really know and understand what is your problem really and what are the best tools to be able to solve for that problem. So when the Melbourne firefighters needed that help of how to do better training, Deakin University actually came up with, well, virtual reality in Vive, you can actually put a headset onto an actual standard issue firefighter's helmet. But they actually took that a step further. They took that fire hose and they actually put a hydraulic uh, unit behind it, mounted it to the floor. So as you got closer or had more water pressure, that hose is really difficult to pull. In fact, needs multiple people. But they even took immersion a step further. They took a standard issue firefighter jacket and actually added heat sensors. So the closer you got to the fire, the hotter that fire was. Now, when you add the full-on immersive experience of that, that level of fidelity in the, on the bottom right there, you see smoke, a lot of noise, a lot of heat, and a lot of force. And now, when you have three other people helping you, and you get down lower below the fire line, and the smoke line, really, and you can see clear, well, guess what? It's a lot harder to pull that hose. So now, all of a sudden, you need communication, a lot of nonverbal communication, a lot of training. And we found that first-person experience of firefighter training really was able to take these remote volunteer firefighters and we really bring them up to um, very uh, city class, world class firefighting abilities in a moderately short amount of time. And we see many of these examples all over the place. Medical education really takes that tr much further. You can take medical education whether from a curriculum or from the ability just to even go through med school or from a non-medical standpoint of learning all the complexities that it takes to even go through the curriculum. Because we talked about this is a much more natural way to learn, you learn deeper, you learn longer, let's take uh, rural, again, rural areas, places that are underserved, first responders. This is one of the best ways to take innovative ways of maybe they're doing CPR wrong. How do I train these basic things? How do I get very low level first responders and get them more effective? Imagine that for even being able to train for large scale, right? So, we're, we're not only seeing that from rural, we're not only seeing it from the medical areas, but there's a, just a general access to good medical education. There's a shortage of cadavers, right? A lot of people do not donate their body to science anymore. And with more and more medical schools and, and medical schools being all over the place, the firsthand experience, even having that practice is actually very difficult. How do you build a world-class pr medical program if you don't have the equipment and facilities? What's better than cadavers? Sometimes it can't even be a virtual body because a virtual body will react if you do something wrong, right? A virtual environment where you're in a, a high stress situation. Um, maybe you're on a scene of an accident and you have two people and you're, it's only one of you. Who do you triage? And what if the media got there before the other ambulance did? And now everybody's watching your every move and I just graduated from my paramedics program. Those are real scenarios that we actually have to, uh, we have to deal with. And virtual reality really is able to actually take you to that next level. In fact, SDSU's um, nursing um, virtual examples are a prime example of taking actual needs of the industry, pairing that with what the university is doing, take what you know about education, what you know about technology, and really solving that defined business problem. UPS is actually one of my, it was a really interesting one. Uh, a lot of it because you don't realize how much UPS invests in training. But UPS delivers in some of the most hostile, craziest environments, and they care about their employee safety as much as they care about you getting your package on time. And so while they're training people for the first time, driving a really big truck on icy conditions, they have very extensive equipment that's actually, har you see people actually harnessed and walking on ice and making sure they don't fall with a package. How do you do that, right? And they, they do that, they spend a lot of money. But being able to train drivers, now it's not just for their safety, but also for our safety. You have seasonal employees that they need to ramp up. Well, how do you get them making sure that they can drive safely um, holiday season when there's a lot of crazy people on the road? Um, and they, they use a vibe for people to do that. And of course, NASA, because space and stuff. Uh, but no, I, you know, the, the NASA example is always great. NASA's been using VR for, for decades. And in fact, uh, working with them and, and doing stuff with Vive, they're like, we've been trying to do so many of these different things, but now we can do this so much better, faster. Um, in fact, because it's a platform, you can integrate many different tools in that space. And in terms of kind of immersive, uh, immersive integrating immersive technology, really, really what's next? You're right, this is early, right? Not early because the technology doesn't work, not early because we don't have a platform, it's early because there's still a lot of growth ahead, right? Even though we are starting to have, see the consumerization of VR and AR, there's still a lot of growth ahead. And 
I, because I work with a lot of startups, a lot of, oftentimes people ask me, should I wait to get involved? Imagine if someone told you the internet was going, the World Wide Web was going to happen, and you're like, yeah, I'm going to wait five years to do this. Would you have been part of the dot-com boom, right? And, and I, although that's more of a business reason to get involved, but the reality of it is so much of the learning and thing that we're going to figure out how to do is going to come from now. We are the ones who are going to define what future virtual environments are going to look like. And that's a tremendous amount of opportunity. The thing is, whether you get into VR now or three years, five years from now, you're still going to have to figure out all those basics, right? So it's better to now take those learnings, adapt it, and drive that evolution. But really, the growth uh, from 2017 to 2020, pretty significant growth, uh, 1.3 to 19.9 billion. Those numbers vary, but they're still pretty large. Um, and we're seeing that mostly happen in the non-gaming space. In fact, if you, the really key takeaways from this graph isn't so much the, the absolute numbers, but in the growth of categories. In 2017, video content, attractions, games, and really other, it's kind of the four major areas. But by 2020, just in less than three years, you're going to see more categories of growth. Right? Games become a smaller piece of that, and other even being a small piece because you're going to see more and more defined categories of that space. And as the total addressable market grows, you're also going to see the ability to deploy these solutions on a much wider scale. So really to kind of summarize, and this really applies to VR and AR, training, design and collaboration, storytelling, virtual showrooms, virtual tourism, all kind of the really fast growing areas in the space. And of course, if you, if you follow a lot of these industry verticals, a lot of subsets into that as well. So what does this really all mean to me? Ultimately, it's increased efficiency. You already know what you want to do, and this allows you to have the throughput to be able to do that, the platform, the technologies to be able to do that. So how do I really bring this into my organization, to my, to my university? Uh, with HTC, with Vive and the Vive team, we've really wanted to help bring innovation and immersive technologies across the board, even if it's our competitive technologies, to, uh, to the market. Right? So we, we've helped many universities develop their immersive technologies program. So a lot of it kind of it goes back down to what are the things that you need to solve for? What is the infrastructure that you need? And being able to kind of partner those other groups to help you drive that message. One really great area that requires very little kind of uh, infrastructure to do is hackathons. Hackathons can either be just that one weekend where you get, you say, I want to go solve this problem, and here are the different headsets and platforms I'm going to use. Who's in? And those are a lot of fun, because you get industry that shows up, you get university that, that shows up, you learn a lot of things. And some organizations take that a step further. They actually take a bigger problem. They say, OK, this weekend, we're going we're gonna to tackle the research question. Let's quantify the problem. The next time we meet up, we're going to talk about what are the tools we need to build that. And then we're going to incorporate AR and VR into that and actually pull that through. What you see when that happens, industry shows up. And in the beginning, you see some of your dev leads show up. And pretty soon, you see some of your executive suite show up because you're like, hey, you know what? This applies to me, too. And this is how you're going to evolve that. And innovation labs. M many places have those innovation labs, right? You're already trying to do different things. But how do you really set yourself up to create a place when industry has a question about technology, they go to you first? It is very hard to keep up with augmented reality, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, computer vision, machine learning. But these are all areas that are going to be table stakes. And even those categories are wildly broad. And oftentimes, as companies and organizations, we may be going down a narrow path because it's all we really know. And so going to these innovation labs is how we also learn what should be happening. Innovation labs happen because these are platforms. Right? These, are not, these are not just simple just headsets. Right? Um, and most of the growth we've seen in technology in general has come from innovation labs. And programs that do this the best do it together. So it's not an engineering school thing only. It's the College of Business pulling together the, the different colleges, the College of Arts, to say, hey, guys, like, what do we think needs to happen out there in the world? And pulling the, college, the engineering students, like, guys, how are we going to build this? And working together like you do in the real world to solve those problems and then really pulling together, whether it's the hackathons or innovation labs, but it's really being able to pull those internal community of resources to really identify that issue. So who's driving this change? Is it the HTCs, the Apples, the Googles of the world? It's actually you. You guys are the ones that are going to define the future. Because like I said earlier, you're limited by your imagination. You already know cross-discipline the things you want to solve for. Even this example here, this is not really even a VR example. They're using HTC Vive trackers and controllers. They're using VR things to solve non-VR problems. 
So many of the examples we've seen today are from the university, and so many of those things work their way into industry in very impactful ways. And we'd love to help you. Um, I want, big uh, thanks to James and, and his team, um, and Michael as well, for that. I mean, it takes a lot of vision. Uh, we've done this, helped a lot of universities do this, but really to have the CSU program, all 23 campuses here represented with that common vision, I really think the reason I got so excited about this, I feel like you really have the opportunity to redefine this overall space in probably the most meaningful way of any university organization. Uh, 23 campuses that are really focused on making sure their students have the most amount of impact working together in a common vision is super exciting. Um, and we're very happy to be able to help. Um, we'll reach out to James about how to get in better touch with the HTC Vive team, but we're happy to kind of just consult with you guys of how do, what's the right way to build innovation labs? How do we get in touch with Intel? How do we get in touch with all these other players in the space? What are the right things we should be doing and how do I drive that impact in the community? Um, my name is Vinay again, and it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, for sure. I can do that. Thanks, Vinay. Great, great way to kick off the afternoon. Um, is the, does somebody know where the toss box is? There it is. Okay. So um, we have about, I want to take about 10 minutes for questions, so we have at least a five-minute break uh, before we start the panel. The panel starts at 1 o'clock, the first panel. Um, and probably before we do that, James will walk you through the schedule today. So we probably have time for maybe two to three questions if anyone has a question for Vinay. So right there. I thought you were going to throw it at me. <laughs> Hi. Uh, great talk, by the way. Thank you. Um, I had, you alluded to something in uh, your slide that was kind of talking about the future and, uh, related to the platforms underlying. So could you expand on the definition of what you mean by platforms? Sure. Like, is that for delivery purposes, that kind of stuff? Right, yeah, and I, and I use platforms in the widest sense here because you have content creation platforms, like the engines, like Unity, Unreal, like we talked about earlier, and a host of other engines as well. So the ability to create content using a common language and set of tools. So that's one layer. Distribution platform, like whether it's Steam, whether it's Viveport, these are all also moderately public accessible platforms, right? So the, you have your dist content distribution platforms, you have your content creation platforms, and then if you look at more of the platform sense from actual development, like OpenVR, the, some people ask me what is the greatest challenges uh, that VR faces. Is it adoption? I can say it's not. If we follow the iOS and Android model of having a dichotomy, a dichotomy of split ecosystems, that is the biggest challenge. And the open XR and open VR uh, initiatives really want to make op uh, VR really open. So that's really where your platform's gonna come in, the ability to hook into other headsets and have a common operating system without asking anyone permission to publish. So I think it's a combination of distribution, content creation, um, and then also the, the integration you need for headsets. Okay. Hi there. Uh, love, love the talk. I was wondering um, what concerns you might have uh, with respect to VR in education. I know, um, and I don't mean to douse cold water on this space. I'm, I'm one of the vendors here. Trust me, I'm a believer. Uh, that said, I mean, I know with you know, whether particularly immersive games that have become a problem, and now we're kind of reaching this other level of immersion. I'm just wondering, you know, what sort of things do you have in mind as issues that might be potentially problematic when it comes to VR and students? Sure, I, I think uh, with any technology, the issues can be uh, really not having the right purpose or need for that, for that tool, right? I think even if you look at the internet, I mean, it, the, can the internet be bad for students? Yes, but can it be also immensely powerful? Yes. What happens is when you create the applications or the tools that help to guide good, safe environments, whether it's from best practices or whether it's saying, my platform, my tool, if you use it, does these things and eliminates these things, well, now you have a viable market product, right? And, and I think that's there, what I look at some of these future potential challenges, I look at it as product opportunities, right? If you, if you think about security may be an issue, we'll have a platform that doesn't share any data, right? I, people pay a premium for that when everything else is free. Um, and I think the same kind of model applies to virtual reality and augmented reality, and I think that's why it's such a great reason to get in early, because you're going to start to see the problems that the mass market's going to see a couple years from now. Cool. Do you have another question? 
Time for one more. Peter. Right, Peter, yeah. Hey, Peter. We're recording, though, Peter, so we don't want to lose your, your, your Oh, okay. Story. All right. There we go. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> Peter Young, San Jose State. Um, so my question then um, really evolves around uh, equipment. And since uh, Vive is a, uh, an outstanding platform, um, when do you see it... The, the, when do you see these headsets becoming all-in-one? We have some on the market already, sure. obviously. But coming down to the prosumer and then consumer level. What, do you guys have any projections on that? Um, so from a HTC product perspective, we don't really comment on future roadmap. However, I think just with any technology, the, the form factor changing, getting smaller, cheaper, faster is always a normal, is a thing that's going to happen. The, the challenge with all-in-ones ends up being still a lot of its modality, having six degrees of freedom controllers, right? So when you're still limited, maybe you can move my, my head around, but if I can only take a step to the right or the left and I lose my controller behind me, is that a good experience? So that's what you're seeing a lot in the all-in-one spaces. Uh, we also have an all-in-one product in China, right? right? Um, and so there's definitely a market for that. Our goal always is to have the most immersive experiences, so I think we take a little bit cautious step of when we pull these products into market. But the all-in-one products exist. There's more and more coming online. You're gonna to start to see a lot more of that stuff in 2018. In fact, 2018, I would project even the end of Q4 of 2018 is when you start to see really the few, that, that, that growth to 2020, I would say is some of the products are gonna be driving Q4 of 2018 uh, and 2019. Um, so those are gonna offer a lot of affordability, but the best-in-class immersion, I think, will still continue to happen from the PC-based uh, 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 headsets. And I mean, PCs are getting smaller, right? We said earlier, you can use uh, laptops, even backpack PCs, so. Yeah. Great, well, thank you very much, Kevin. Yeah, thanks. Thanks.